it should be the peak of pleasure. For me, orgasms has become a task. It's a, it's work. It's a job. The average woman might manage two or three a week. They come every 30 seconds for four to six, sometimes eight hours. And guys, if you think that this sounds like fun... How would you like to walk around with an erection 24 hours a day or have an ejaculation and then within a few minutes have a full-on erection again? And stay that way 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Meet the women for whom orgasm has become a never-ending nightmare. Coming, climaxing, peaking. Orgasm is the most intense and pleasurable experience you can have. You breathe more deeply. Your heart rate doubles to 175 beats per minute. Your genitals engorge. 116 muscles pulse and contract. And then, pow, waves of endorphin fueled pleasure sweep the body. Sounds great. But what happens when it all goes wrong? When you wake up one day to find your sexual organs demanding attention, no matter how unsexy you feel, when the need for release starts to derail your everyday life. Los Angeles at rush hour. Heat, traffic, and a woman with a spiky temper. Meet Jeannie. She's bursting to get home. Well, you know. Oh, come on, get your bloody-ass Jaguar up there. Wanna push? Jeannie has a rare and perplexing condition that researchers have just discovered. It's called persistent sexual arousal syndrome. Does the persistent sexual arousal make you more grumpy? Absolutely. Yep, makes my fuse very short. Oh, shut up. I was here before you were. Jeannie feels unrelenting physical arousal. But this is not about pleasure. Far from it. Have you ever slammed a finger or thumb, whatever, in a door or someplace, and you've gotten it where it's beet red and it's throbbing? It's the same sensation in the fact that the clitoris has got the blood rushing, and you have that same terrible throbbing. So that's painful. There's an insatiable beast down below that's been calling for 10 hours, and it's now deafening. For some reason, the sitting in traffic is worse. Um, and I don't like being in the traffic, so it's a combination of me getting a slow burn here now because I want to get moving and get on the way. It's never going to be the most plausible excuse for a traffic violation, but Jeannie's desperate to get home to masturbate, or as she coyly puts it, take care of business. I can't wait to get in the house, go to the bathroom, and then take care of myself. So with that, I'll see you later. Ten minutes later, an eerie calm descends on Sand Canyon. How was that? Much better. I'm good to go. For me, orgasms has become a task. It's, a, it's work. It's a job. It's something that I would be ever grateful to go the rest of my entire life with never having another one. I've had enough in my, in my lifetime for myself and probably half of the pop, female population of this world. Persistent sexual arousal syndrome isn't like nymphomania. It's not that these women are permanently hot for it. It's just that this pressure, this genital tension builds up and it can only be released in orgasm. The condition can be set off by the weirdest things. Buses, cars and boats are all problems because the vibrations can send these women over the edge. Even household objects can get you going. In a leafy suburb of Atlanta, Rachel, a housewife and mother of three, confronts the menace of a washing machine intent on seducing her. 
When you're doing the housework, Rachel, are there any things that you avoid? I hate the washing machine. The washing machine, for whatever reason, when it goes on the spin cycle, I don't even like to touch it. The vibrations have a tendency to trigger the, the persistent sexual arousal, and it'll trigger an episode. What would it feel like? Um, is it quite violent? Is it sudden? Yeah, it's, it's real sudden. I mean, like, you know, if, if I'm doing something and I accidentally bump into the washer, or if I put my hand on it, it's, it's more than, than I can handle. Rachel's day is dominated by a 1 to 10 scale of genital discomfort. 10's unbearable. Does it go up to a 9 or a 20? It can be as high as a 9 or a 10, depending on what stage of the, of the cycle that it's in. And, and uh, you know, even, it, it can even depend on what kind of mood I'm in, if I accidentally bump into it or if I, if I put my hand on it. I obviously don't sit on it for obvious reasons. It can be, that That I think would do me in. <laughs> Are you ever tempted? Um, I did it once, uh, shortly after I noticed the persistent sexual arousal. I, I sat on the washing machine one time, uh, just waiting on a load to be finished. And uh, yeah, <laughs> the, uh, it, it, not only did it trigger the, the persistent sexual arousal, but uh, the spontaneous orgasms that came afterwards were enough to, to make me get off. Just as scratching an itch makes it worse, so Rachel can't let herself be drawn in by the washing machine. It's to the point now to where, unless the water is running and I'm putting clothes in, I don't want to be near the washing machine. It's a queer thing when the washing machine knows how to send you into a spin cycle. Persistent sexual arousal syndrome has affected women of every age, ranging from 19 to 80. For Atlanta housewife Rachel, the symptoms developed eight years ago. The first time that I felt it, it was just like a, a dull throbbing. It's progressed over the years to where not only is it throbbing, but it's throbbing like a heartbeat and it's like I can hear it. It's loud enough within me that I feel like I can hear it. So yeah, it's definitely gotten worse, which scares me because I'm only 29. And I know that there are women that are like 80 that have it. And the thought of facing the next 50 years with this is, is more than I can think about right now. Jeannie also developed the symptoms of persistent sexual arousal syndrome eight and a half years ago. They were gradual over the first couple of months, maybe two or three months, and then just, bing, skyrocketed overnight. And only one time did I decide, well, you know, I'm going to give myself a release every time I feel this and just see if I just happened to be someone that needed a multiple orgasm. And I got to 10 in one hour. And partially from exhaustion because that's quite, that's just a tremendous number and from shock I just kind of laid back on the bed and went oh my god and I could keep going I could keep going um, something is majorly wrong something's majorly wrong and that was when I started my quest of seeing doctors this isn't a problem that Jeannie's going to sit on, and her search for a cure is going to take her to some surprising places.
With this insatiable beast constantly shouting in your ear, sometimes you have to bury your head in the sand of mundane activities. Any simple distraction will do. Washing, cleaning, polishing, all help keep the beast at bay. You need simple, repetitive actions. Rubbing, rubbing, rubbing. Do you feel like the persistent sexual arousal is turning you into a neurotic housewife? Did you say neurotic or erotic? Neurotic. Neurotic, yeah, yes. <laughs> yes, I think so. Um, it's hard that, that there's only two spots on the spectrum that I can pick. It, you know, there's no in between. It's not, oh, I only feel like cleaning one room today. No, it's either I clean the whole entire house or I don't get out of bed. How are you feeling right now? Let's see, how, how do you describe it? There's, there's a lot going on as far as uh, throbbing down in that area. So you feel hot and bothered? Kind of, but not, not in a sexual way. Not like, you know, oh, I need to go find my husband right now. Not anything like that. It's more, it's more bothered than it is hot. How many orgasms a day could you have if you weren't controlling the persistent sexual arousal? Wow. If I wasn't controlling it, they're probably, I don't even know that I could put a number on it. It would be in the hundreds. They come every 30 seconds for four to six, sometimes eight hours. And I'm sure that's well up in the hundreds. I'm not a math person, but I'm sure it's it's up there. I mean, if I had no self-control, no willpower, I don't know that I would ever leave the house. It would probably be me and however many toys I could get sent to the house <laughs> at any given time. <laughs> lots and lots of batteries. <laughs> Back in Los Angeles, Jeannie also dances to the persistent sexual arousal drum as her son Frank looks on. I have found that the more focus I give something, the less I'm aware of the arousal. So I try to keep myself moving and busy until I'm just like really exhausted and fall asleep. So I'll come in and I'll do a lot of cleaning. I'm real good at just moving around, I'll dust, I'll pick up lint, whatever, just to keep my body going. It's hard to sit still. I'm always moving. Maybe it just rearranges, you know, the pulsations or something. Plainly, none of these women have a vacancy for a cleaner. The support needs in their lives are more of the medical variety. But sadly, this is an area where the doctor's bedside manner seems to be lacking. I told my gynecologist, and he acted like I didn't say anything. He had a good snicker about it, and, you know, he got a big grin from ear to ear and said, you're every man's dream. And I'm not kidding, he, he was down, like, in the trenches, right? And he looks up at me, and then he went back to what he was doing, like I had never said a word. Well, I reacted the way any woman would, and I said, you know, it's not funny, it's not a joke. Um, how would you like to walk around with an erection 24 hours a day or you'd have an ejaculation and then within a few minutes have a full-on erection again and stay that way 24 hours a day seven days a week if the man that treats women and all he works in is that area of the body looked at me like that oh then I definitely am the, the only one there's there's nobody else on the planet You tend to think of Americans as sexually upfront in a Jerry Springer sort of way, but vast swathes of the country are Bible Belt areas, deeply conservative and repressed. Try explaining persistent sexual arousal there. This is exactly the problem Heather had to face. For this blushing young bride, the forbidden feeling started to develop three months after getting married, turning her world on its head. Nine years on, her husband and parents pray with her as a faith healer attempts to exorcise the demon monster. We want to make a difference in Heather's life, Lord. And that the name of Jesus is glorified. And, you know, 
daughter is blessed, set free. So have mercy on us. Show us how to pray, Lord. Yes. How many people have you told? At first I told almost everyone because I was just so anxious to find out if anyone else is suffering from it and um, you know, if anyone knew of any kind of help. Some people thought that I was demon-possessed or that um, perhaps someone had cursed my womb. You know, saying things like, you know, if I wasn't a Christian and had this problem, that, you know, I would have ended up as a prostitute or a nymphomaniac. Despite her devout appearance, Heather's been a bit of a wild child in the past with several previous boyfriends, including the notorious singer Marilyn Manson. There's been a cruel suggestion that she's been cursed by her past. I don't know how I ended up with her. It's the strangest of gatherings. Family members and Bible bashers discussing the unreasonable demands of Heather's private parts. I thought, boy, she's got to be sick of religious people by now. That was the first thought I had after reading this email. Is, boy, she's got to be sick of religious people. No wonder she's calling on weirdos like us. Yeah, there's so much misunderstanding. How, how you can't get any more humiliating than having to tell people that you have to masturbate <laughs> for it to be relieved. It's, and there's nothing. It's, yeah, so it's like it, it, you just laugh or you cry. For Heather, the feelings of persistent sexual arousal syndrome kicked in during her third month of pregnancy. It was in my third month of pregnancy that I just woke up one morning and there were these sensations, you know, within my vagina. And um, I, I thought perhaps it was just hormonal. So, um, you know, I, I masturbated and made it go away. But then the next day it came back. I talked to my, you know, obstetrician about it and she had no idea either, but she said that hopefully it would go away after the baby was born. Yay! Yay! For Rachel, persistent sexual arousal syndrome also came as an unwelcome extra when she had her first child. I was 21. I had just had a cesarean section for the birth of my son. Uh, it was a couple of weeks after he was born. And, um, I just assumed that the feelings that I was starting to experience were a result of my hormones trying to, to find that medium ground again. And so I just kind of dismissed it. It was my first pregnancy. It was the first time I'd ever had a, had a child. So I just assumed, you know, that that was natural. I had a lot of postpartum depression, so I spent a lot of time on the sofa crying. <laughs> and even laying on the sofa crying, it would start. Whoa. And so it was even harder because it was like, I'm, I'm not turned on. I'm not in the mood. I don't, I, for the first time in a long time, I don't want to have sex right now. Why is this still going on? While for the other girls, persistent sexual arousal syndrome was linked to the first twinges of pregnancy, for Jeannie, it coincided with the onset of menopause. I started spotting rather than having regular menses. So I thought, well, maybe I'm um, starting menopause and maybe it's related to something with the hormones. Although anything I had read about menopause, um, women lose their sex drive. And I thought, well, that would be just like me, to be the one oddball and go the other way and start to have an increase. There are only 40 known cases of persistent sexual arousal syndrome in the world, and no one knows if it's hormonal, neurological, or related to abnormal blood flow. Usually, orgasm involves build-up and release, desire, arousal, increased blood flow, and orgasm. In persistent sexual arousal syndrome, it's off the scales. It's all tension and little, if any, release. The sexual organs are constantly crammed with blood, ready for action, no matter what your state of mind. But the cause is unknown. All three women saw an assortment of doctors for help, but even they were in the dark. To date, 
I've seen probably seven or eight different gynecologists, an internist, a urologist, a neurologist, a neurourologist, a psychologist, a behavioral psychologist, a psychiatrist. None of them had heard of this condition. None of them knew the cause. None of them had any idea how to treat it except the urologist. So I sent her an email. Wow, what a shock, because she said, yes, we have treated a couple of women with this, and it's called persistent sexual arousal syndrome. The day that I found out that it had a name, that, that one day was like, other than the birth of my children and getting married, one of my top five, just finding out it had a name. My husband and son went to get their hair cut at the barber and while they were sitting there in the waiting room, my husband glances down at the table and sees that there's a magazine open and it's the Boston Globe and it's an article about persistent sexual arousal. I got to read the Boston Globe article for myself and, and I just started weeping because here was exactly my problem, you know, women describing what I had been through for nine years and here I thought I was all alone. Somebody finally validated that I wasn't the only one on the face of the planet with this problem, which is how I felt for that entire six years, especially when you can't find anyone else who has it. You can't find all those doctors, no one had heard of it. You really feel like a freak. The remarkable discovery that this freakish condition had a name spurred Jeannie on to set up the first ever persistent sexual arousal syndrome support group on the internet. What, what are you doing, Jeannie? I'm checking the message board for the support group I started for women with persistent sexual arousal syndrome. Are these women all over the world or just in the United States? Oh no, they're all over the world. They're, uh, from, there's one on here that lives in Hong Kong. There's one in Australia. There's a couple in the UK. And so far the rest are here in the States. 58 and rising. What was thought to be as rare as hen's teeth has turned out to be much bigger. I think there's probably a lot more women out there than anyone could imagine. They're too ashamed, too embarrassed, think they're the only ones. I mean, there's been someone that's joined the board that says, I've had this 15 years and I thought I was the only one. Oh, and I know that feeling so well. Naming things helps to give you a sense of control over them. It's kick-started Jeannie into a program of change. The weight and the persistent sexual arousal syndrome have both got to come under her thumb. The hips have got to go, the spare tires got to go, and the PSAS has really got to go. Well, I'm pushing 50 pounds now over the last uh, eight and a half years since it started. That's a lot of weight to carry. So. I've decided uh, to try to make this the year of nothing but positive things for health. No smoking, uh, start getting in shape, lose the weight, uh, and find some kind of positive good treatment for PSAS and get my life back. I'm just trying to take control, that's all. To get control, Jeannie will do anything, no matter how off the wall. She's tracked down an alternative therapist and arranged for her to come to her house. Here's Dr. London, who thinks she might have a cure. Hi. Oh, hi there. Many how are you? Fine, thank nice you. Nice to meet you in person. Hi, you too. How are you doing today? Oh, been looking forward to this. Good. I have. Good. Yeah. Good. Let's get going, shall okay. we? Okay. All right, good. Will this box of tricks be the answer to Jeannie's prayers?
How does persistent sexual arousal syndrome hit your relationship in the bedroom and beyond? Is it the answer to every lover's prayers or a curse from hell? Heather and Jeremy got together after a whirlwind romance ten years back. He was 19 when we married and I was 21. Our wedding was really a beautiful day. You know, we were just so in love and we just wanted to get married and just start our lives together. But little did they know that three months later, their world was about to be turned upside down. How's it affected your marriage, you think? Oh, in every way, in every, every single way. I mean, we haven't had what other people have had. I mean, we've had to deal with hard issues, you know. We haven't got to sleep together for years. Ninety days into their marriage, and persistent sexual arousal syndrome dealt a savage blow to the young lovers. Suddenly, out of the blue, Heather couldn't even bear her husband's touch, an ironic twist to a syndrome named persistent sexual arousal. The persistent sexual arousal definitely affected our sex life from the very start, because if I didn't have the sensations, I didn't want him touching me, I didn't want him to even, you know, make any advances towards sex, because if the sensations were not there, then I didn't want them there. How do you think that made him feel? Um, I don't think he felt good about it. I mean, he never, never made me feel guilty about it. And I think his attitude was just kind of, he had to, he had to accept it, I and mean, what else could he do? Sex has become such a minefield for Heather, she prefers to sleep on her own. Where are we going now, Heather? We're now going to the bachelor pad. This, <laughs> this is Jeremy and Jonah's room. I call it the bachelor pad because it's, um, it's always a mess for one, and because this is where they hang out and play guitar. Right on, bar chords. Play a D for me. Play a D. Father and son also sleep together in the double bed for necessity to give Heather some privacy. We have a king size bed and they sleep in there together. And I sleep at night in my son's room. It started off that way because having only two bedrooms, there was really nowhere for me to go to masturbate. Of course, that can't happen in front of Jonah, you know, so there's the whole sheltering thing. You know, for me, sometimes I'm going to be like, he needs to sleep on his own. He's eight years old, for God's sake. You know, <laughs> he's got to be a man, for God's sake, you know, and I'm a man, and he needs to be sleeping in his own bed, you know, but um, it's not ideal, but there again, it's, it, for Heather, it's just a necessity. What husband would think that having a constantly aroused wife means he has to sleep with his son every night? What do you say to men that say these women that suffer from persistent sexual arousal are every man's dream? Just typically freaking stupid because they're thinking of nymphos, basically. They're thinking of women who would love to have sex all the time with them and, you know, that's probably very rare. Well, just this is too, but this is something completely different. These women do not want the, pro you know, the, the sensations, the sex persistent sexual arousal syndrome, they hate it. It's caused some women to the point of suicide. Heather has taken to a daily ritual of sketching in her diaries to cope with the problem of the syndrome. You get an idea of the way she feels through the way she draws. I, I just try to draw an example of how I'm feeling in this. I, you know, my vagina is burning with unwanted sensations, you know, even making her mad. Mm -hmm. But her, her face is um, shaded in and, and kind of hidden because this, this, this problem is a you know, something that you can't easily talk about and you, you basically suffer alone. But persistent sexual arousal hasn't entirely destroyed their marriage. Is the Heather that you know now still the Heather that you knew when you first met? Yeah, she's the same person, absolutely. I mean, a little bit older and fatter and we're a little bit more ragged and rough around the edges in some ways, appearance-wise, but... Uh, yeah, I mean, we have something much deeper. It's, um, I think our relationship is not uh, what we can get from one another as much as what we can give to one another. You know, thankfully, here we are, 
you know, we're going to be married 10 years. And um, we definitely love each other in a much deeper way. And we know that we can make it through very hard things, you know, and still, still accept each other and love each other. It seems persistent sexual arousal syndrome isn't the same for everyone. In Rachel's case, it hasn't killed a healthy sexual appetite. Far from it. Where are we up to now? Um, well, I have something special planned uh, for John for Valentine's Day and uh, found out about a store uh, called the Satin and Lace and they sell um, outfits and uh, underwear and, and toys and things like that. So uh, I just wanted to go and have a peek and hopefully get something to be able to take off for him for Valentine's Day. Thank you so much. Oh, wow. Y'all just have a little bit of everything here. May I help you find anything? Um, you know what I'm looking for is little shorts with the roughly butt. <laughs> Sorry, she saw me coming. For most of the time, Rachel avoids anything that might trigger her persistent sexual arousal syndrome. But there are some triggers that she doesn't mind being squeezed. What about your husband? Is he a big trigger? Yeah. He's the biggest trigger of all. Yeah. We're newlyweds, so we're still very affectionate. And it started off just, uh, you know, him touching me or, uh, or stuff like that it's to the point now to where he can take off his shirt and he'll do it but there's going to be no such luck yeah but i do have not. like i said i have the black and roughly butt boy panties oh you like do boy briefs yeah let me show them with the you. with roughly butt and roughly the... butt okay not just crotchless but roughly it's... butt how often do you come to these kind of stores rachel um these kind of stores not very often not as often as i'd like to let's put it that way oh fantastic yeah, and these, yeah, again, slingshot, but very cute. Whereas most women are like, not tonight, honey, I've got a headache. Yeah, I'm always, <laughs> okay, <laughs> let's go. <laughs> okay, are you ready for some raunch? Rachel's husband has a rather lean and tired look to him. All right. From the husband who can't get much to the husband who wouldn't mind the odd night off. Got some shoes. It's a good thing I have no political ambitions. <laughs> <laughs> I called it the horny toad disease. It's a frog out in the southwest that's the horned toad. What about when she starts jumping on you or chasing you around the kitchen table? <laughs> um, sometimes that happens and you're like, you know, stop, quit. You know? <laughs> but it's, um, I won't say it's odd. It does make for a fun time. Um, you know, because it's not every day that women are aggressive in that way. But, um, you know, sometimes it's, it's inopportune. <laughs> Given the frequency, John can't always rise to the occasion. How do you feel when he turns you down, Rachel? At first, I took it so horribly. Oh, my God. Because when you know that there's a way to relieve it, and you don't have access to that way, you know, and so your emotions are like all over the place and mood swings and everything else that, uh, that I just let my emotions get the best of me. And a lot of times I was in tears. I was like, you know, you don't really want me and, and stuff like that. And it was probably really hard. Plus it's hard. It was probably really hard to deal with. What would you say to many men out there who would look at Rachel now and think, <laughs> she's every man's fantasy? Well, like I said before, it's, it's a double-edged sword. You, you think you want it until you've got it. <laughs> Jeannie doesn't have a husband to worry about. She's been divorced for eight years. Her last marriage hit the rocks of persistent sexual arousal syndrome. It was just too weird to explain to her husband, and the relationship went west. Who's that there, Jeannie? That's my ex-husband, my little soulmate, and me. Wow. When was that taken? It was about nine years ago. Seems like another lifetime. You look like a famous country singer. <laughs> yeah. 
We did some two-stepping. We did some line dancing. They were good days, weren't they? Yeah, they were. They were pretty happy. Never know what can happen and in was the future. And it sexual arousal that drew you apart? Well, that's why I left, because I couldn't tell them about it. Yeah. Didn't want to tell them. My whole life is different, period. Um, used to have, huh, used to have a really wonderful husband, and we shared a lot of the same things with golfing and camping, and we owned a boat and would go boating. Um, I really lost my husband over this, too, because I couldn't tell him. Well, why couldn't you tell your husband? Well, because I was very, very embarrassed. How was I going to explain it? Because I didn't understand it myself. What am I going to say? Gee, I need orgasms every 10 minutes, and it never goes away, and I don't know why. Can you ever imagine yourself having a happy, sexually fulfilling relationship? Or is that just a dream? Um, where there's life, there's hope. Jeannie now lives with her son Frank, who's one of the few people she can tell about her condition, whether he likes it or not. I don't like to get into it too much. It's your mother, you know, but... Um... He knows the gist of it. He knows the basics of it. We, we don't talk in detail. I'm not going to... I spare him that, but he, yeah. he knows. Well, it's your mother. You don't even want to imagine her having sexual organs or anything, you know, but... Uh, you know, she started to tell me about it, and and I, it sounded bizarre to me. I'm like, whoa, you know? I'm really, my hands are tied. I just try to make her laugh, seriously, you know, make her laugh when when she's down or whatever. And, I wish my hands were tied. Or, <laughs> Jesus, H. Nice. Here we go. There we go. That's, no. the, that's the kind of joking we do. Tie my hands. Oh, oh. OK. Jeannie knows that if she's ever going to get her life back, she has to find a cure. Conventional treatment of persistent sexual arousal syndrome involves surgically sealing off abdominal blood vessels, but in America, this treatment is expensive and carries no money-back guarantees. Jeannie resorts to alternative medicines, which are cheaper and seem less invasive. On the advice of a friend, she arranges for an alternative pain therapist to come to her house. Tell me, what are you hoping to achieve from this treatment here? At this point, even if I just get some relief and it's not gone altogether, I would be happy with that for starts. So that's, that's my hope. California is a broad church when it comes to alternative therapies. Here's Dr. London, who's going to perform her rites. Jeannie's treatment is based on an electronic type of acupuncture, which works on trying to balance the body's energy flows be interesting to see if I can even focus on the treatment because that's what I'm focusing on right now and <laughs> and actually the persistent sexual arousal now because I'm getting high anxiety is going through the roof. It is very very strong right now and uncomfortable. On a scale of 1 to 10, where are we at now? We're at a 20. But that will be the least of Jeannie's problems. As they say, there's no gain without pain. Okay. Are you ready? Why don't you have a seat? Okay. This is just like acupuncture, but it uses an electrical device instead of um, needles. Okay. Okay, so there's no entrance into your body. Is there anything with that? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh. Sorry. That's a good sign. Keep breathing, keep breathing. Sorry. Yes, I feel electrical shocks. <laughs> right. Thank you very much. I am gripping this with a death grip. Sorry. Ow. Ouch. Oh, that's go. worse. Oh, yeah. Let's just hope Jeannie doesn't blow a fuse.
Treating persistent sexual arousal syndrome can be a shocking experience. Ouch! Oh! Oh, you're not going to do that to my feet, are you? Um, I mean, I'll be right out of the chair. It, it may not. It may not be that painful. I have a low sensitivity to pain, and I'm a wuss. All right. So just keep breathing. Oh, I can feel that. That's just kind of like a. T okay, oh, that's good. Okay. That's good. Let's hear the other one. Keep ouch, 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 ouch. Breathe, oh. breathe, Almost done, almost done, almost done, almost done. Oh, yeah. One hour and 240 volts later, silence. I have no pulsations right now. I'm going to time this to see how long okay. this lasts. <laughs> Doubting Thomas that you are. Huh? No. no. No, I know, I understand. I just, I, I'm just real curious. This is the first time in eight years that Jeannie has been pulsation free. This just feels very odd. It's certainly not a complaint. It just feels, it's like it's been so long that I don't remember what this feels like. Do you feel like your old self? Woo! <sighs> Let yourself cry. Let the energy leave. It does, it's just. I have not felt this way at all. And, and you know what? Well, all right, you wanted me to talk feelings. Part of me is absolutely afraid that this is just going to be like short-lived and I'm only going to feel this and you're going to walk out the door and mm -hmm. get in your car and by tonight I'm going to be exactly right back to square one. Can you enjoy where you are? Put that fear on it and just enjoy this for long, as long as you have it. Can you focus on that? Okay. I will. Okay. She keeps looking at the clock. <laughs> well, you would too. I went ten minutes. It's nothing. Am I done? You're done. I'm a baked cake. <laughs> oh my. I'm going to stand up. I have to stand up and see if it's different when I stand up. Walk around. This feels so strange. It really feels... Frank! That is Wonder Woman. <laughs> I have zero pulsations. We have timed it. I am at 12 minutes with no feeling. Nothing. Zero. Really? No tingling, no any. I know you don't like to talk about it. Nothing. I have not felt that in eight and a half years. What? That's the God's truth. What is it? It's this wand and all these things, and she checks your energy and gives you whatever you need. Eight years is a long time. Jeannie's persistent sexual arousal syndrome was gone completely for 48 hours. Her first break in eight and a half years, but sadly it didn't last. From slight flutters, the sensation slowly built up again. But at least she knows there exists some kind of temporary relief. A long-term cure may be out of sight, but perhaps the more enduring solace is that Jeannie knows she's not alone. On the grounds of a problem shared is a problem lessened, we arranged for the women to meet in Los Angeles. It's the first time they've ever met in person. Are these my girls? Are these my girls? Hi! Uh, hi! Hello! Who's who? I'm Rachel. You're Rachel. Oh, Rachel. <laughs> You're a son of a gun. Heather. Hi. I'm like, you can't guess who I am. Hi, <laughs> Oh, my gosh. Yeah. So nice. Well, welcome to California. Thank you. Thank you. I'm quite an <laughs> experience so far. <laughs> The girls are joined by another sufferer, 20-year-old student, Bat Shua, who learned of the girls from the website. No, oh. no, but I brought you all little welcome bags. Oh, I, I, made, I made, I made, Rachel. They're all 
the same sort of kind of, but I tried to do your little personalities on this. And she knew to put chocolate. You better believe it. <laughs> chocolate. Yes, we had this unbelievable. See, you're married, and so I figure you're, there you oh. are telling him that I need another orgasm, and he's like. <laughs> Here the girls can relax and talk openly about their condition with one another. I live here and my day's been hell, so I'm happy <laughs> As night falls, horny toads come out to play. The girls hire a limo for the night to take in some of the Hollywood hotspots. Just pour everyone a glass and we'll oh, have a toast. Have we'll have a persistent sexual arousal toast. <laughs> Four orgasmic women out on the town. We've made the bulletin board, girls. Oh, look at that. Oh, how they know where you're coming. <laughs> coming. Oh, no. <laughs> Later on, the girls feel comfortable enough with each other to open up and share their secrets. It's a beaver sticking its tongue out, believe it or not. <laughs> yeah, the, the, it's actually considered the classic dolphin shape, but see the point. The purpose is the vibrations. You know, it's a beaver. I know! I told you it was tasteless! Is it really a beaver? Yes! <laughs> really? Okay, what does it do? Wait! It's, bring it's, that sucker over here! It's a silver bullet with a, with a stick <gasps> around it. It's a beaver! <laughs> you did not! Oh my god, it's got claws! No, oh, get it out of that's here! That's the bunny! Ah! A bunny and Boy, a that makes my, a my jacket ever look like nothing. I've never heard of that. I don't know why they like anthropology. Like, like, well, not anthropomorphic. A bunny and a beaver, isn't that like cross uh, <laughs> reproduction or toys? <laughs> Go figure. This is basically just, um, it's supposed to be waterproof pocket rocket, but it's actually not. <laughs> I can't help it, that's what they name it. Pocket rocket. I didn't name it. Um, but it's actually not waterproof because they lied. <laughs> and it goes to the sleeve. You guys are never gonna get over this, are you? You can try your gynecologists, your alternative pain therapists, but sometimes laughter is the best therapy. And it goes to the sleeve. A long-term cure might be further down the line, but at least the pain of isolation has been banished. For the girls, this coming together is something they will never forget. Even if we had met in the swamps of Louisiana, I still would have such fond memories of, of being with these ladies. It has just been one of the best weekends I've ever had. What do you think you'll take away with you? Hope. I definitely have more hope. I have support now that I feel like, you know, I, I hadn't had in nine years. I really, truly believe they're going to figure out what's causing it or a way to treat it so that we get our lives back. And um, I'm going to keep plugging forward and doing whatever I can and pushing. Um, I will. I'll do whatever I have to do.